Jesus, that your divine will will be done and that your bread will be imparted, O oh God, and that it will be used, Father, when we go back to our several homes, that we may be better administrators for you as we work with your sheep. Yes. Oh God, we can do nothing without you, but all Thank things you. are possible yes. through you. Thank you. We surrender right now, oh God, all things. I shall not say. Have your way in in the name of Jesus. And Father, we thank and we praise you for it. In Jesus' great name. Hallelujah. And amen. 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 Father, thank you. All right. We would just like to begin the class by giving a little bit of an expose about my background. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. As I um, introduced myself earlier, uh, Dr. Judith Shaw, I am from the state of Illinois, um, Illinois State Council. Bishop D. Rayford Bell is our diocesan bishop, and Elder Dion Shaw is my pastor and my husband. For um, educational background, I have an associate's degree in early education. I have a bachelor's degree in elementary education. I acquired my doctorate degree from the Midwest Apostolic Bible College under the auspices of Bishop J. E. Moore and the staff at the college. And I had my doctorate for approximately seven, eight years. Uh, they asked me to teach this class so that we could impart information unto pastors that are seasoned and those that are just stepping into the shoes that God has placed on their feet to be better administrators to the sheep that they are over. We understand that God, he is sovereign. There is the spiritual side as well as the natural side, and we have to minister to them all to reach the whole. Mother, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. All right, we're gonna start off by passing out our syllabus. While we're doing that, if we could just start with this brother and come work out with and just introduce yourselves because we're just sisters and brothers in the body of Christ. Yeah, I'm Deacon and Training Scott Smith from Columbus, Ohio. I'm a bishop there for the church at the time on the stop. So, Lord, it's nice to meet you. Please, Lord. I'm Sister Yolanda from Texas, where the Diocese Bishop is Bishop Johnson Blaise. Little Bethlehem Apostolic Faith Church in uh, Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. We're in the Eastern Southern States Council where Bishop Bob uh, Leslie is the Council. Bishop Bethlehem Faith Church is the Council. Nice to meet you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm Chris Award. I'm Sister Betty Robinson, and I'm from Saigon, Michigan, where District Elder James Buford is my pastor, and uh, our uh, bishop is presiding Bishop Alfred Singleton. And our our council chairman is District Elder Michael T. Martin. All right, amen. Your pastor and I have things in common. He has a set of twins, does he not? Yes. And I have two sets. Oh my goodness. Please allow my sister. Sister Ellie from Cayman, New Jersey, passed up. Amen. It is so very nice to meet you all, and welcome to our class. All right, we just want to go over our syllabus right quick, and then we're going to go right into our subject matter at hand. By no means is this class a complete expose of what this subject matter entails. It is just too broad to cover in a day, two days, a week, even a month or a year. So this is where I am going to introduce some key points to you, and then it's going to be up to you to go back and then go and feed on the information and the resources that I'm going to refer you to. Not only are you limited to these, there is a massive resources out there. So whatever God is directing you to, in addition to what you get privy to today, please feel free to incorporate it in your search. All right. Church Administration, Synodalist Pentecostal Churches of the Apostolic Faith Incorporated. Instructor, Dr. Judith Shaw. Textbook, Church Administration Handbook. I'm going to hold them up as I go over them because these are very powerful and um, I'll even pass them around to you. 
And if you notice, you're gonna see they're well used. I have papers, markers, everything in them because these are the things that I was taught with, with Bishop Moore. He recommended, he had us to buy, we studied in depth, and this is where this class is birthed from. So that's one of the resources that you would want to make your friend if you are a pastor and or considering being a pastor. In addition to your Bible, let me emphasize, the Word of God supersedes anything, everything that I will say to you today or anything that is written in any of these textbooks. Yes, sir. That's written in the textbooks. But what Bishop Moore has done, he has taken the time to get the textbooks that coincides with the Word of God. We have studied the scriptures that are being referenced to in those books, and they do line up with the Word. So please feel free to search the scriptures. Make sure that they are in line with what you're seeking as dealing with your people. So this is the um, textbook that we're using as the foundation. The author is Bruce P. Powers. In addition to that book, there are several more I'm going to refer to throughout the course. You need this as we go along, and I'm going to talk about sizes of your church. If you have a small church, that is going to be a book that needs to be in your hip pocket. All right. This course will cover a panoramic synopsis at an accelerated caliber of suggested procedures and guidelines in operating a church effectively and easily efficiently with a biblical approach. That's the total sum of what we're doing here today. Course of studies. We're going to, number one, introduce what the definition of administration is from a biblical standpoint. Point number two, that we will look at phase one, relating to organizations and people. Number three, phase two will cover performing administrative responsibilities. Part four, phase three, developing leadership ministry skills. Point five, we will give a brief overview of enhancing the smaller churches. And suggested class requirements for further enriching studies. Number one, your Bible. Number two, management of biblical approach by Myron Rush. Number three, theological church government, Paul D. Dugas and advancing the smaller church. These are the books, and I'd like for you to just pass them around and peruse them, because these are resources, as I said, that you are going to need to be familiar with as you administrate over God's people. Now, we've gotten our syllabus out of the way. As you look at the books, we're gonna now deal with the crux of the matter. Admin <laughs> administration. What does administration mean to anybody? Just jump in. What does the word administration mean? Information to help. Okay, very good. Information to help. Now let's put that in terms of church administration. What would that mean to you? Good, very good, Mother. Setting things in order. And so when you set things in order, you have them under control. And therefore, it brings forth this word, management. You cannot have an effective church if you don't have order. That management births order. Is God not a God of order? So God wants his church to operate in an orderly fashion. He doesn't want us to haphazardly do things, to slipshod, or to just say whatever, and then think things are going to fall into place. He wants you to set things in order. And that's what church administration is. First of all, you have to understand, church administration is, number one, a ministry. It is not a method. You have the secular realm that uses church as a business. This is not your business. This is your ministry. It is ministry and not a method because God himself will give you the order in which to conduct 
his business. Administration, I want you to get this word. What does administration mean in terms of church administration? What do you think we're doing when we're in administration over God's people? What are we doing? Yes, ma'am, and that's where the management comes in. Okay. But the administration, I'm dissecting the, the subject matter so okay. you can get a good understanding. The, the administration part is where you are growing people. It defines what your purpose is. You're growing people. What do I mean when I say growing people? What does that mean? And learning people have a function. Okay, you're, you're teaching people how to function. Were you going to say something? Developing. developing, good job. Now, when we teach them how to function and develop, what we're doing, we are guiding them to reach their fullest potential. For what? What do you think that potential is directed toward? We're guiding them to reach their fullest potential in what? Thank you. That's the word in their destiny. And that destiny is not predicated on sitting in your church forever. God can send somebody to be up under your tutelage for you to feed them, to nurture them, to raise them up, for you to send them on for them to go to their next station in life to be what God has called and ordained them to be. Sometimes pastors get stuck in a rut and they think if God sent a soul there, that that soul is there forever. No, they are not. It is, they're there for that season. You have different types of, of saints now. Let's, let's talk about that. You have um, saints that are permanent, where they're going to be there until the rapture comes. Bottom line, whether they are a good saint or a bad saint, that's your saint forever. And then you have saints that are seasonal. When I say seasonal, God sent them there because they have a season in, your li in their lives that only your ministry is going to meet. My ministry is not the same as yours. My ministry is not the same as yours. Your ministry is not the same as hers. But when a season comes into their lives, they need to be fed the bread that's going to come from the vessel that God has already ordained, that has what they need to nurture them, to love them, to raise them up, and as mothers say, to grow them up, and then send them on to the next level in their lives. You're going to have some saints drop in <laughs> and they are not there for spiritual reasons they're there because they want to get a report and take it elsewhere they're rolling stones but you're going to get them but you have to still know how to manage and feed them so as the, the pastor the administrator the leader you have to have some skills what kind of skills do you think I, I'm referring to that you would need to deal with these different types of people? What kind of skills? There's two particular skills an administrator must have because if you don't, you should not be in an administrative position and or you better ask God to give them to you if you don't have both. Patience. Thank you. You need these skills. Interpersonal and intra. Somebody give me a distinction between the two. You have to have these skills. In order to deal with people and be effective, you must master these. If you don't know what they are, then I doubt if you're using them. I don't know if you have them and they're hidden but you may not have them and you need to get them. Give me a distinction. What is interpersonal? 
Just think of the prefix, inter. Inter. Think of that prefix. I'm, I'm an educator. Um, so <laughs> if, if I say things, you know, like um, dealing with the predicate, the verb, and da da da, that's just my profession. I'm sorry. Be able but, to feel that person. Okay, enter. He's there. That's where you can reach out to the group and you can feel or empathize with the whole. You know how to touch each person God sends into your life and in a positive way. All of us there? Amen. We're going to find out. Now, that's the interpersonal skills you must have. If I am a person that just, and, and there's a book on personality, you need to read it, Bishop Bell gave it to us, and it was, it was just, and I, you know, I saw some things in myself that I wanted to get away from. But uh, <laughs> we, bring, we bring baggage to the table, we do. But as an administrator, you're gonna get people that totally rub against your brain, just by personality. I'm not talking about spirit. Right, right, right. Personality-wise, and I'll give you an example. Personality-wise, I am quick, fast, and in a hurry. My husband takes his time. Does he irk me or not? <laughs> At times, yeah. <laughs> Do I irk him or not? <laughs> oh, but we love each other madly. But I'm saying, personality-wise, I'm wired totally different from him. And he's wired totally different from me. You're going to meet those people and God's going to send them to your church to sit at your feet. And you're going to have to have these interpersonal skills to make them feel loved, welcomed, and of Mm-hmm. Yes, it's work being an administrator. Now, we dealt with some interpersonal, intrapersonal skills. What do you think that means? And again, go back to the prefix. Intra. Intra personal. Don't you answer. <laughs> Intra. Well, if you're reaching out, and one, if you're reaching out to others, then in the other, then you're going to be working with those that come to you. Not those. Intra. Yourself. Inside yourself. And try personal means that you have skills that you got you all under control. When somebody's being a total doofus in a board meeting, you do not blow up. You do not blow up and put them in their place. But you have you so under control that you keep you out of the way and you still deal with them as a saint. Intra. You don't express your feelings every time you don't like what's going on. All right. And there's going to be a, um, this book. If you don't get no other book that I bring to you today, please get this book. <laughs> Working with difficult people. You need, you need this book. Are those books in the uh, bookstores or yes, Bible bookstores? Um, no, just any. We we ordered those. Um, oh Lord, I can't remember where Sister Janice ordered them. But just, the ISBN number should be in them when you look at them. Just that that number will put you right in. And I'll tell you what's a good resource: Barnes and Noble. I have found material biblical and or academic. And I mean old, outdated, where they said it was no longer in print, and they tracked it down for me. So Barnes & Noble is a very good resource. But um, yes, ma'am, you can get that, and it doesn't have to be at a Bible bookstore. All right, so the intrapersonal is where you have skills to keep you under control. Yes, ma'am. Are you saying that an administrator should be happy? Pastors no, those that God called into leadership position. Okay. This class basically was um, initiated for pastors. Okay, I don't have nothing to do here. Oh, 
<laughs> yes, ma'am. It's supposed to be pastors that are in here mm -hmm. or those that are embarking upon their pastorship. And so um, I wouldn't tell you you have to leave that would be that you, you and the Holy Ghost, but um, it's, it's supposed to be for pastors and, and leaders. Yes, ma'am. All right, pastors and the leaders, you know, of the church. What are you working with the pastor? Are you an assistant pastor? No. I mean, I'm just I like am. a sixth. Okay, no, you're fine. If you're an assistant pastor, you're fine because you're still in that leadership role. <coughs> yes. <coughs> oh, excuse me. You know, I'm just working like as assistant, not a pastor, but reports or whatever. Just work in the office. Okay, secretarial-wise? Right. Okay. Like I said, I would not tell you to leave. Um, oh, this is good information. Yes, if you can use it, please, by <laughs> yes. all means. Yes. Amen. Amen. All right. So now we, we know that intrapersonal is internal where you got you, yourself under control. Now, as the leader, you are to always recognize that you are this. What does a helmsman do? Think about voting. You are the one that leads, you guide, you steer the direction that the church is going in. You set the tone of the atmosphere of the church. Do I have any other pastors besides sister here? Okay, the pastor sets the tone for the church. If you're a weak pastor, you have a weak church. If you're a mean pastor, you got mean saints. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Be a sweet pastor. Be a sweet saints. Because what's in you is what you're going to feed to them. And they're going to eat it. And they're going to become a replica of you. So therefore, you have to be sure that you're leading and guiding. You're holding the hill. You're steering that church in the direction that it should go in. And in your steering, who should you be acknowledging first and thank you foremost, God. All right. So now, let's, if everybody's finished with that, I'm going to take some, take this off and then I'm going to make room for something else. Can I take this off? Okay, now we're going to deal with phase one. We're talking about church administration. There's three particular points I want you to know about church administration and you as the manager. It is a science, it is an art, and it is a gift. Let's fill those in. As a science, it deals with your procedures and techniques. where you have a, a, a responsibility to study the word, and not only the word, study other resources to perfect yourself in your ministry. You owe it to yourself, you owe it to your people, but most importantly, you owe it to God to be the very best that you can be over his sheep. As an art, this is where your sensitivity And those skills, remember we talked about intra and interpersonal skills come into play? This is where you really have to be able to utilize those skills at the right time, in the right situation, in the right way. You have to perfect those things. And as a spiritual gift, we want you to refer to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28. That whole chapter really deals with spiritual gifts, just so you know. But we pulled out that one verse because it pinpoints to where we're going in our church administration. Do we have any questions thus far? Okay, no questions. Now, I would like to pass out something to you. And again, I only have one pastor. I'm going to see for this class, they started us out where you were supposed to take it and get credit, college credit 
for the course. The course um, entails some work. And um, the information and the handouts that I'm going to give you is going to require you to do homework. So I, I would like for somebody to even start a rule, and I need to know how many is going to complete the course. So because I'm supposed to even give you a grade and all that good stuff to find out who all is here for the duration. to know as a leader, time is of the essence. The adversary will try to rob you of precious time that you can be using to build up your kingdom of the world. Now you have to look at your life, your schedule, yourself, and see, where do I use time? This is what we call our time robber sheet. What I want you to do now for the next two minutes Write down everything that you plan to do tomorrow. I want you to do that now. Tomorrow. Yes, ma'am. The things that, so how many carry a planner? How many have a planner? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And you use it, not just have it, use it. Put your hand down. <laughs> Amen. You need, remember we had, the, let me put my word back up here. Amen. If you don't make any plans for your day, guess what? Anything can happen. But when you plan your work and work your plan, you achieve goals. Remember that phrase. When you plan your work and work your plan, you achieve goals. So you need to start using a planner to put order into your day. All right, back to our sheet. You're going to list right now what you plan to do tomorrow. Those things need to go there. I'll give you about two minutes to do that. half a minute. Okay. Now the other side of this sheet this is what you're going to bring back to me tomorrow. If I'm not mistaken, I believe we meet the same time, same place here tomorrow. So they scheduled me for two days. Okay. 
tomorrow, when you come back, you're going to fill in this side and tell me what you actually did. This side is what you plan to do. This side, what you actually did. What you're going to do is see if you're going to keep your schedule or are you going to let distractions take you away from that which you plan to do. And then we'll go over it and see what we can do to kind of alleviate some of those distractions. Now, as administrators, this is where you get to find out something about you. What kind of an administrator, and if you're not a pastor, what kind of person are you? Describe yourself. Um, I'm a personal sense of humor, a one-on-one, -on -one, personal, interactive, like the um, close settings. I don't get uncomfortable in close, um, close areas. Okay. Describe yourself. Um, easy going. Uh, I like to have fun. I'm a family person. Um, very outspoken. Okay. Yeah. A little domineering. Good, I like that. She told the truth. Good job. All right, we're we going to learn some things. Describe yourself. Uh, I like working with people. I don't like uh, people being disappointed. I mean, if I say I'm going to do something, I go to the length of really getting it done just because I said I'm going to do it. Uh, and um, it's just a book. Okay. I like helping people. Describe yourself. Well, I'm a very quiet person, and I like uh, working and uh, talking with people one-on-one -on -one basis. And I'd rather work with paper, paperwork more so than with people. <laughs> <laughs> shows and personality shows, the woman is more domineering in a leadership um, leadership role and more of a perfectionist. The man is more laid back, oh, it'll take care of itself, or give them space and they'll do it after a while. <laughs> we don't do that, do we, sister? No. <laughs> we have a whip and a chair. <laughs> Okay, but we need to temper both. We need to make a, a mesh between the two. Mother, would you please describe yourself? Well, I'm outspoken. Mm -hmm. And um, I like things done in order. Yes, ma'am. I'm an organizer. I like I like her. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm an organizer. And I like, I'm a timely person. Okay. I like things that you go on. Started to, started to. Yes, ma'am. Did I, did I pass my test? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I started it. I, 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 like, I like things. If you, if you have it on paper, you're going to, like I started 
service starts at 8. I want everybody there starting at 8. Yes, ma'am. This is one person. I like things to be done on time. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. And God is tiny. I agree with you. All right, I'm passing on something. This is from um, the book that I just let you look at. And what I did, like I said, I pulled out key points. And <laughs> what you're going to do is find out some things about yourself. Yes. What I want you to do. Well, I'm sorry. I'm not, I don't mean to neglect you. I thought you were busy on your computer. I, I didn't am, want to disturb I'm, I'm, you. I'm doing. I'm doing. I'm doing two things, uh, too. Uh, but can I? Can you yes, interject? Ma oh, okay. Please, sir, introduce yes, and describe yourself. Okay. Uh, I'm of yourself that you find in a dictatorial type person. And that's pastor on there because like I said, this class was designed for pastors, but now it's either pastor and or person that you are. Write down qualities that coincide with this. If you don't have any qualities, just put them out. If you have some, yeah, some of you already said it, the cat is out of the bag. You're domineering, put it down. What kind of a person are you? What kind of a pastor would you be? Just write down some, some qualities that coincide with this. A dictatorial pastor. Dictatorial. Write them down. Some of the things that you put down, just at random, just throw them out at me. And I'm going to put them under one or two of these two categories, the positive or negative. Like, order. Likes things in order. Okay, you like things in order to the point of? Perfection. Okay. Is that positive or negative when you're dealing with people? It can be, it can be both. Room. Okay, but the average person to be perfect, got a tally there. Give me another one. Directed. Directed. Say it again. Abrasive. Woo! We don't have to ask whatever long. I'll give that two strikes. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, can, I can really explain that. I explain really it. Can. Explain it. I can. Because I'm not one of them that just, you know, it's all right when I done told you how you're supposed to do it, and that's, I, that's what I want you to do. Amen. But now you done went and did something else, and now you're crying, and I need to just tell you, I told you so, didn't I? Okay. Leader, make sure you get your directives from God. That's the type of leader you want to be. Theocratic. Not what the people vote on. Not what you feel is best for the people. But what God is breathing and birthing into your spirit, this is where I want you to take my people as I lead you as the helmsman along the way. Anybody got any questions? 
And my whole objective, if I can snatch that soul out of hell's fire, then I'm going to do what Jesus did. Yes, I agree with you there. You, you're going to do what the Lord says, but that's not the way they want to be treated. Okay, but how do you know how they want to be treated? Because you just said everybody wants to be treated with respect, uh -huh. and honor, and whatever. Uh -huh. Everybody wants that to be treated. That's a and human need. You cannot. That's a, that's a documented, a natural, innate human need. And I'm gonna give you another mother. You just taking me all up out of my context. No, I'm sorry. But no, you, no, you're doing good. You're no, doing good because it, it fits right here. It fits right here. This is another part of the seminar we were gonna deal with. What does that word mean to us? What does that word mean? Every last valid. one of us. If it's valid. If it's true, if it's valid. Okay. Not in that sense, Mother. I get what you're saying there, but this is not the sense I'm talking about. But every last one, I'm good, every last one of us in here, we need it. You will literally dry up and emotionally die Amen. without this right here. She's in the ballpark. Validation has to come from people, though. Can it come from God? Yes, God, if you will put it in your spirit, you put it in your heart. But if you don't have somebody else to cultivate and reinforce it, you will soon not believe it because you can't see it. You need somebody you can touch. You need somebody that can feel what you're feeling and you can get eye contact and that emotion being fed and filled in your spirit. God is a spirit, but God uses people That's to right. reach exactly. other people. Validation means, just like my sister said, you need somebody to tell you you're all right. You need somebody to pat you on the back every now and then and say, you did a good job. You need somebody to hug you and say, oh, sister, you are worth something to me. If you walk around and just tell, you ain't no good. I knew it the first day I saw you. You make me sick. I knew you weren't going to be successful. I didn't even know why you bothered to try. What is that doing to their spirit? Standing down. Thank you. What does the Bible tell us to do? Hey, talk to me. Come on, we church folks. I'm going to shout now. Come on. You need to define what it is that was wrong. Ask them what kind of consequences would come from it. You ask, you don't tell what new choices they have to choose from to correct it. And then give them a how. See, all we've been doing is yelling at folks and say what I told you, but you never told them what to do and how to do it at the same time. You gotta tell people, you gotta make things plain. Can I just share a little bit? This is even doesn't have anything too much to do with the class, but just to put things in perspective. The generation today is called an X generation. They have no definition. My generation and some of you in here are called the baby boomers. The baby boomer generation, we contributed more to society than any other generation. We came up with more inventions. We worked the um, society role as models and brought on production in our workforces and are outstanding today than any other generation. The baby boomers are validated. We are honored so until they have certain types of music and things that they gear where it's no longer up to date, but it's not obsolete. They keep it alive because the baby boomers pour more money into society than any other generation. I gave you that information to let you see the difference. X generation, 30 and under. 
They've contributed nothing to society. They are so intellectually inept. <laughs> they are. Until they are paying baby boomers to retire and stay at work and get a double check because they know we'll give them a quality day's worth of work. And the baby boomers are so intellectually inept they'll only mess up the business. Mm. I'm an educator, that's why I can tell you these things. I know these things. What does that say to us? We've been telling people, I told you what to do, but we haven't told them how to fix it. We have not given them a chance to realize consequences for the wrong decision. We just said, because I said so. How many guilty of that? I know that's right. Me too. Let me raise my hand. You never gave them a chance to be an individual of worth by asking, what do you think we should do? Instead, I said. Sometimes, like dealing with God, you know, asking why, 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 you just have to do what he tells you. Well, I didn't know that. Again, you're, you're, you're trying to get them to come to the realization of what the word says as the leader. But when you and that person come to that conclusion together, then he takes ownership. It's not coming from you. That's yours. No, this is ours. God gave it to us. Do you get what I'm saying? That's what this is about. And once you give them a part of the choice, then you tell them how to do it. Now, leader, this is where you know your word. You pull it out and you get it in context. Don't give it your meaning. Don't give it a secondary. Give it the contextual. Do you know what I mean when I say that? No. Pardon? No. When you, I say give it the contextual, what did the author mean when he wrote it? Who was he talking to? What was he talking about? You don't give it your meaning and pull scripture out of context. Then you wrestled it out of its setting, and it does not mean what you're referring to. So as leaders, we have to know that. Now I'm, I'm, I'm getting into apologetics, but I, I dealt with all of them. But what I'm trying to tell you, you have to know your word. You have to know when to use it, how to use it, and the setting. But when you can meet these four mandates, that soul that you are working with, you have success in keeping them in the house and alive, as opposed to beating them down and letting the devil finish it off when they get home and they don't come back to church. Now, I started you off with, did I erase servant leader? Remember I said, pastor? You are the servant leader. What do you do to serve your congregation? What do you do? Talk to me. How do you serve them? Or do they all serve you? Listen. Okay, listen. That's a part of being a good leader, yes. But tell me, how do you serve them besides listening? Don't you try to meet their needs? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. What what kind of needs? Because everybody come with baggage. Every soul that comes in the door, I don't care how good they look, how bad they look, they come with baggage. All their needs that you can meet. Name some, mother. That's what we want. We want to get the definition. Give me some. Give me some. Emotional needs. Okay, emotional needs. If you're trying to meet an emotional need, can you be an emotional wreck yourself? <laughs> No. You got some people that's trying to do it. There's a, a pastor and first lady, both of them were sexually assaulted in their youth. And they neither got over it. Started a church and made a shipwreck. So make sure you're stable. 
in any area you're ministering in before you try to dish it out to somebody else. That's right. So how emotionally stable are you? Give me something else. Physical. Ooh, Tigers, give me this. Okay, physical. What do you mean when you say physical? Well, they're going to be in health. You don't want them out of shape because that could affect them in different realms. Okay. No, that's that's a good aspect. That's not the aspect I was thinking of, but that's a good one. And and I got a book for that one too. See, I came prepared with everything today, but because as saints, we don't always get everything we need. Oh, my daughter must have took it out. Okay, I had one in here. I'll try to bring it tomorrow. I had a book in there that dealt with that, and it's according to the word. Yes, sir. You're right. The physical, but then there's other things dealing with the physical. This is where I was. What if you get somebody that comes into your church, and I don't want the older mother to say anything, but they're in a wheelchair. And not only are they in a wheelchair, but their um, bodily functions are no longer working. And then not only that, they need somebody to come and get them dressed to come to church. Now these are needs. And not only that, they need somebody to feed them before they can get them to church. We have a lot of baggage that's with this one area. What do you do? You appoint somebody. But they live next door to you, Pastor. The pastor does it. The pastor does it. But you got to be at church. You got to be at church. Well, you appoint somebody else at church while you take care of that physical needs. Hmm. Let's say. <laughs> 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 all right, all right. No, that's a good thing, Pastor. Well, again, my husband met a lady just like this. And she doesn't want anybody else but my pastor to come see my husband. Mm -hmm. My husband. And I've talked to her and ministered to her over the phone, you know. She has those needs. But God put her in contact with him first. And so she's um, self-conscious, of course, you know, about these things going on with her. But because of the spirit of God that's in him, this is who she's comfortable with. What do you think my husband does? Thanksgiving. He makes allowance and tends to her needs. Because she has a soul. And remember, a servant leader. And then I tell you that some of them are seasonal. We don't know how long she's going to be in that condition. We don't know how long she'll be there. But he is doing what he should do as the servant leader. But then the average pastor, um, I'm not, nobody in here, guess who they call? Missionary chairperson. <laughs> Go see Sister so and so. But that's, again, you have to be led by who? If my husband would cart her off into the hands of somebody else, I really think she would wither and die. That's how fragile she is. I really do. And so again, God has to give you that direction. He has to give you the leading to deal with his sheep. And when the time is right, and that she's ready to be turned over to the missionary chairperson, sure. But until that time comes, the servant leader serves. How many pastors go pick up people and bring them to church? I'm not a pastor, but I That's do. all right, you assistant. That's good. That's good. I do. Yes, sir. Yeah. And, and it's only for a season. It's not going to be forever. This is, again, your season of testing to see what you're made of. God's going to progress you. You're going to get the church buzz. You're going to get that ministry going. But he wants to see, do you care enough to go get them? Will you make that sacrifice or are you too big? Where's my dictator? You sitting on the throne and not God. All right, little peon, go pick up that other peon and get to church. But you got some pastors that do that. They're too big. A peon minister had the nerve to tell 
um, a, a pastor or somebody told him to do something in church, God didn't call me to do that. He called me to preach. Mm. Was he fit to preach? Mm -hmm. I tell you no. Ask me where he's at today. Backslidden his two left shoes. Because he wasn't hungry. He wasn't being led by God. There's another, let me ask you what the, there's another phrase that I've heard. Uh, sheep beget sheep, yes, not shepherds. That's right. Pastors don't get right. Don't, sheep beget sheep. The but, pastors don't. Uh, well, pastors can talk to people and invite them to church. Of course, he's never excluded. Again, we are living epistles, and God put people in our path. Who put that woman in that wheelchair in my husband's path? Uh, not me. God did it. And that's for this season. Because she's a sheep. Sure. But God is God. Mm -hmm. And she has a soul. Because you're a pastor does mm -hmm. not negate the fact that you're a soul winner. The being a pastor does not exempt you from being a missionary. We are all on a mission every day to win souls. You go out there and you see somebody sinking because I'm a pastor, I walk past, I think not. You get on your hands and knees and do whatever it takes to deliver that soul. Again, remember who you are. You're the servant leader. You're here to serve in whatever capacity God has called you to serve him. You're not lording over God's people. He admonished us not to do that. But you are to serve them as the Spirit gives it to you. All right, our time is vastly getting away from us. Um, I know we're not going to be able to finish this. Do we have any questions? Mother, you're welcome. You're welcome. I won't fight, believe me. No? Okay. All right. Because I, I don't want anybody to leave here misunderstanding or not having clarity on anything I said. Because if I say something that is not in this book, you do not have to listen to it. But if it's in this book, I admonish you to obey. All right. Anybody find out some things about themselves they didn't know before they came? <laughs> Anybody going to change some things? Talk to me. I don't fight. Yeah. I'm going to say it like you. Amen. Or would you pray for me? Amen. We're going to pray for you, Jesus. <laughs> All right. So I gave you an assignment. Now I need to show you some things also. To continue with this class and we will be back here tomorrow this is a workbook and I'm going to give you an option I'm going to read an option to you in order to get a grade you're going to have to either do one of these of the three mandates and I have them written down dollars for you to get it. I'm passing one around to you from a student that took this class for me the last time I taught it. He completed it and I believe he got an A. But that's the workbook that everybody will have to will have to fill out and you get the option. You can either take a test from me that I compile and complete the workbook. You can take this book which is the foundational book by Bruce P. Powers. Read it, do an outline, and give me a five-page essay. Or you can take this book and write a summary 
and take a test that you and I agree upon, closed book. You have three options, which you want to do in order to complete this course. Think about it. That's when is completion required. Um, you have a whole year. Oh. Mm -hmm. I know everybody's schedule is busy, and um, you know we only meet nationally once a year. What Bishop, Bishop Nehemiah Smith, he took it from me and he mailed it to me. I will write my name, address, and all that on the board, and you have all year to finish it. But your time robber, did you get a time robber sheet? No, ma'am. Okay, your time robber is due tomorrow. I passed those out just before you came in. It's up on, it's at the top there it is. There it is. And, okay. Oh, I need one as well. Oh, yes, sir. Tomorrow. Now I need a consensus of the class. Um, I'm going to take this off. Everybody done with these notes? I need a consensus so we know what we're doing for this class and how I'm going to grade you. How would you like to be tested? Are you going to do a book report? Have no book report. Wait, you're going to read that book, do a report, and give me a five-page summary. Book report and five-page summary. Or you can outline the book. Yeah. But you're going to take a test. I like the outline. Okay, well, the census of the class, we're going to take a poll. And then I gave a third one. Uh, you outline the book, or oh, this is where I compile the test, my test. This closed book, and you're still going to have to do a summary. Oh, yeah, I work. Because I want to make sure you can meet five pages. A wow. summary of that book. Yes, ma'am. Th th this year. book. Th yes, you got a whole you year. Find that book. Yes, that's why you got a whole year to do it. A whole year. Okay. Yeah. This is the book. I won't ask you any questions from the other books. Um, gentlemen, you weren't here when I passed these around. If you want to, you can peruse these. These will really help you in organizing your church. And we talked about working with difficult people before you came. I'm sorry for being in But this is the book that you need. Bruce P. Powers, he is the, uh, you know what? Bishop Moore stocks these, if I'm not mistaken. Janice Creighton. Anybody know Janice Creighton that's right out there and where registration is? Okay, ask her. She, I think they stopped me. Mr. J? Yeah, uh huh. Yeah, I'm from Illinois. Oh, okay. Yeah, and I took the class from him. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is Ruth P. Powers and his church administration handbook. It is very, very valuable. Yeah. So if you can get this, this is what I want you to outline. I want you to go through it if you choose this. So, how am I testing this group? I need to know. Give me a consensus. We'll start from the bottom and work our way out. How many for my test, closed book, five page summary? What happened to my test in your team? Yes, ma'am. I have a question before you make that decision. Yes, First of all, I didn't know this was a course. Um, the second, that's not a question, but a statement. But if we were to choose, do a course this year, are we going to get any more instruction, type of instruction, or do we just take a road and go through it as we are able to? I won't see you again until next year. Mm. I mean, just tomorrow. We're going to go to part two tomorrow. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so I need to um, find out how many would like for me to compile a test, close book, and you got the Holy Ghost, so I have to trust you. And five page summary. Okay. <laughs> Outline the book and take a test that you and I will agree upon. I'll give you, I will give you the option of throwing some questions out to me, and I will compile the test from questions that you gave as a, in addition to what I put with it. I got one hand, only one hand for number two. And book report, oh come on people, let me pick your brain, come on. <laughs> Yes, sir. Well, number one is where I'm, I'm Ooh. <laughs> You just burst my bubble. Okay, 
raise your hands so I can put a number up here. One, two. Only two. Mother, you're not going to vote? Not that one. Oh, okay. <laughs> Tell me which one. Are you with me? Oh. Your test. Oh. No, that was the third one. Yeah, my test is the third one. The third one. Oh, good. Mother's on my side. One. Yeah, I like that. I'll take that one. All right, I like that. Back to one. Two for me. Okay. Okay. I, I'm, I'm soliciting. <laughs> All right, for number one, raise your hand so I can get this on here. Number one is um, the outline the book, and then you do a test where you throw me some questions. Yeah. I make up the test from the questions you the give me, report. in addition number to maybe a couple I might throw in. But not the mass majority will not be from me. Who will still be reading the book? Yes. Yes. Okay. I'll go with one of three. Okay. I like that. Well, I am gaining by leaps and bounds. Is that book up number there? Number three. Dr. Shaw? Ma'am, which one? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh huh. It's okay, a yes. That's the book. Yeah. Excuse me. I want to pass that around. Okay. Um, I have both. I'm liking this. Is, is this? That's the workbook. No, that's you're gonna have to. Everybody does the workbook regardless. Oh yes, ma'am. In addition to the workbook, now we doing this. Yeah. I told you. I don't see you for a whole year. I'm an educator. Well, I'm going to move to Illinois for the next year then. <laughs> no, but I have to get it in you. This, you're going to do the workbook. The workbook. It's required. That's a mandate that you have to do. You have to do it in order to get credit. The workbook. That's what I'm passing around to show you that that's like um you know to keep you on course as you read the book. But then after you read the book because you're getting college credit from me, you have to choose one of these for an assessment. I have to assess you. That's what this is. An assessment is just another word that they use for a test. I need to test you. And this is what I'm giving you an option to choose from how you want me to test you. That's all. But the workbook is open book. Open book. We all have to have the same. Well, I'm going to be great. I've got other papers to grade and things to do, so I would like to take one format and do the whole group, if that's okay, Pastor. <laughs> I'm going to ask for your permission. I pulled the book with number three. I'll be actually redoing the work for the pastor. So then he's going to take your test and do a closed group test. Okay. Do I have another? Now let me help you. My test done all the easy. Okay, then take that. Five no, but they're fair. They're fair. I do not try to make it out of out of reach. I'm fair. I am. And I'll give you a little hint. I will give you the test next year when we come. And I even go over. But you have to know the information. Because I want you to be successful. So I'm trying to make it as appealing as possible. So I can do it like that. I will, I will make it up, and I will have it when we come next year. And I will give it to you so we will go over it. But you have to know the information. So you will owe me the workbook, and you can mail it to me. I'm going to put my address. And you still, you're still going to be able to do that five piece. So you can mail it or bring it to me. You have a whole year. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, on your time robber paper, pull that back out. You're not done. Pull it out. Time robber. So, are we agreed that it's going to be my test, closed book, and five page summary in addition to the workbook? Yes. Okay. Professor, you, where do we get the workbook from? Um, you have to order that from Janice Creighton. From uh huh, from Illinois. I'm gonna write all of this down. I, okay. I'm trying to do this because my time is wrapping up. All right, take out your time robber sheet. Take it out on the bottom. Put a little asterisk. Write yourself a note. I want you to get in your mind a date. Don't tell me. Don't tell anybody. Write that date down. You are going to mail me your time robber sheet. 
If you mail me your time robber sheet, you get 10 points. If you do not mail me your time robber sheet, you lose 20 points. Does everybody understand what I just said? I'm going to put my address up now. rubber sheet and the date that you have written down there must coincide with the postmark date on the envelope. Okay. I want it. The date that you wrote down must coincide with that postmark date on your envelope. But this is, we just send the sheet in. Yes ma'am. And you have to, tomorrow you're going to bring it back. Now tomorrow don't leave it home. Don't leave it at your hotel. You have some things we're going to discuss on there tomorrow. But then this is the final assignment to it. I'm giving it to you today. The final assignment after tomorrow, you wrote a date down. And on that date, you're going to mail me that time robber sheet. And you have to have this postmark on your envelope to coincide with that date that you wrote on your sheet. And you get 10 points. All right. Free adventure. You need to call me. That's my number. In order to order that book, I'm writing Sister Janice Creighton's name, and she's from um, Christ Temple. Joliet. Bishop J. E. Moore. Pastor. See her and she can make sure you get that book. Because I believe we stopped it. If I'm not mistaken, we stopped that book. Church administration. It's, it's out there. Somebody hold it up. That's the handbook. Yep. Yeah, the workbook. I'm sorry, the workbook. And um, church administration. Hold it up. There we go. Church Administration Handbook. Those two, I believe she stocks those for Bishop Moore, for the college. And I just have one more point before I let you go. All right, everybody got the information they need? check with um, Elder Donald Bryan, <coughs> excuse me, sometime today to find out if they're still offering it for a course. The last time I taught it, like I said, it was for a course, college credit, and these are the mandates that they had to meet. And so if he says that it has changed, I will let you know tomorrow, but I'm giving it to you pre-adventure. It has not changed, so you'll have this information. All right. Can I take it off now? One more last point before I let you go. As pastors, administrators, and leaders, what type of a church do you have? You have to know what type of church you're in. What kind of a church do you have? The personality of it. Now, Bishop Dagger Dates, Bishop Smith. Right now, 
we are a transitioning church. Okay. Okay. That's positional. Not personality. Personality. Okay. We are a family. We are a family or There we go. That's what we do. All right. If you don't know your church, let me give it to you. Church size predicates the type of um, personality that your church has in terms of the size. Um, one to fifty. I'm sorry, you're not even a family. Your mission. How many got one to fifty in their congregation? When you have members on, from one to fifty, you're not even a church. Church. Your mission by the standard of your operational skills and abilities. I'll, I'll, I'll give you the information. All right, well, if you have 50 to 150, then you're a family-oriented church. And when I say mission, that means that you're limited in the amount of auxiliaries, and ministries, and branches that you can reach out with to the community. That's what I'm, what I'm talking about, mission. You're really single with what you can do and limited with the manpower to do it with. That's why your personality is a mission. If you've got 50 to 150, family oriented. Everybody knows everybody. Everybody's close knit. You feel what one another feels. You rejoice when one another rejoice. You weep when others weep. Thank you all for coming. 